Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Distinguished Lecture Series for today. I'd like to welcome you all uh, to this event. The International Relations Club and the Model United Nations team and the, and the Creighton's Asian World Center proudly sponsors this Distinguished Lecture uh, luncheon today uh, for 2013. It is my pleasure to uh, do the introductory comments. My name is Chris Bradbury, and I'm the Interim Vice President for Academic Affairs at Creighton University. The Asian World Center Lecture Series aims to bring leading scholars and prominent individuals to visit Creighton and share their insights and experiences with scholars, policymakers, business leaders, and students, and the general public. These lectures are all free and open to the public. And again, today our co-host is the International Relations Club, Model United Nations team. We'll give them a big plug. And it's my pleasure now to introduce our distinguished speaker. Our address, to, address today is titled, Diplomatic Challenges at the UN, an Ambassadorial Experience from Thailand. Our speaker is Mr. Narajit Singhaseni, and he is the ambassador and permanent resident representative, excuse me, of Thailand to the United Nations. We're very happy to have him here today. A little bit about his background. Until his appointment as ambassador, he was deputy permanent secretary in the Minister of Foreign Affairs since 2007. He served as ambassador to New Zealand, Samoa, and Tonga. In 2001, he was appointed Director General in the Department of Information and Foreign Ministry Spokesman, and then later, Director General in the Department of East Asian Affairs. He has served as Chief of Staff to the, to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, having been given the rank of Ambassador and attached to the Foreign Ministry in 2000. He, has, he was concurrently, between 1994 and 1999, Deputy General uh, Deputy Director General in the Department of East Asian Affairs and the Department of International Organizations. He was previously posted in New York where he was Minister Consul of the, at the Permanent Mission to the United Nations. <clears throat> he has also held various other positions in Bangkok, including the Chief of the Office of Foreign Minister, having joined that ministry in 1979. As a graduate of Thailand's National Defense College, Mr. Singh Hasseini earned a Bachelor of Laws from, I'm going to mess this one up, Chula Longkorn University in Bangkok. Thank you very much. The ambassador helped me on that one. <laughs> and he also earned a master's degree from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University uh, at, in Massachusetts here in the United States. He is married and has two children and also has relatives joining, joining him here today. Please help me welcome our most distinguished guest, Ambassador Singh Hasseini. Mr. Ambassador. Sawadee uh, Krupp, that's the Thai greeting. Uh, Dr. Bradbury, uh, distinguished uh, faculty members, students, distinguished members of the Omaha community. Uh, thank you for inviting me here, and thank you for attending this lunch. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, the topic that was so kindly given to me, diplomatic challenges at the UN, an ambassador of the oral experience from Thailand, uh, is not one of my doing, but uh, suggested by Creighton, and I'm happy to, to go with it. Uh, the talk will be divided in basically into three parts. One would be, this, as you can imagine, Thailand. The second would be something you may be interested in, is the UN or the United Nations. And then on the last portion would be my own experience. But uh, coming to a uh, university, I couldn't resist myself. So we just have to start the talk with a quiz. <laughs> because uh, Jose was telling me that he is supposed to teach a class today at 12.30. But he told his students that any of you who came to this talk 
will be given credit for having attended his class. So rather than just making it too easy on you and just eating and listening, it, it starts with a quiz, naturally, uh, in a university. Well, the first quiz was, is, uh, I, let me tell you, all, all, there's going to be three questions and all of them will be very easy. The first question is, the first Asian country to sign a treaty of amity with the United States. A treaty of amity is like you starting diplomatic relations. You may have had contacts before with traders, with missionaries, Jesuits, I'm sure. But uh, a treaty of amity means those two countries have started diplomatic relations, formal diplomatic relations. So we'll just leave it at that. The second question is, one country offered to send elephants to the United States <laughs> as a gift as far back as 1861. And the third question of the quiz is, one Asian country fought with the US in World War I during the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and later in Iraq and Afghanistan. And just to be clear, fighting on the same side. <laughs> fighting on the same side as the US. So without making it too difficult for you, the answer is Thailand. The first question is the Asian country to sign a treaty of amity, and you guess you would be asking yourself, what, Thailand? Not, not China, not Japan? Well, it just so happened it was Ch Thailand. Yeah, we were called Siam at that time. We didn't change the name to uh, Thailand until eight, 1939. 1939 was when we changed the name to Thailand in keeping with many other countries whose name ended with land. I think uh, we had people going abroad and coming back and said, who knows Siam? So it was changed to Thailand. Part of the, the change from the absolute monarchy into uh, constitutional monarchy. So we signed a treaty of amity with the US in 1833. So just, just uh, so you know, it was called the Treaty of Amity and Commerce whereas the US and China signed a treaty of peace, amity, and commerce between the US and the Chinese Empire, which is known as the Treaty of Wang Gye in 1844, so 11 years later. And with Japan, you signed the Jap J Japan US Treaty of Amity and Friendship, or the Convention of Kanagawa in 1854. The second uh, answer to the quiz of uh, sending elephants, it was our King Mongkut, who some of you would know from the story The King and I, the Broadway play or the movie. He was king, and when we established diplomatic relations, he, when he learned from a captain of an American ship called the John Adams, that you didn't have elephants in this great big country, he offered to send some uh, pairs of uh, male and female uh, elephants. And the term he used was that they should be uh, let loose in your forest, particularly tropical ones, and then you can tame them and use them. Uh, by the time the letter came, unfortunately, uh, civil war had broken out, and the reply didn't come from President Buchan Buchanan, but from President Lincoln. And the reply from President Lincoln uh, said, while thanking the king for the offer, said, the climatic conditions of the U.S. were not suitable. Moreover, the use of elephants as a means of transport was unnecessary, since steam on land and on water had been our best and most efficient agent of transportation and commerce. So no elephants came over. 
Otherwise, you may have some elephants down in Florida, and it, you, instead of the gators, you might have the jumbos. <laughs> so, the first part of my uh, talk will be on Thailand. I think that uh, will set a good background for you to understand where my country comes from and what I do and represent at the UN. Uh, I'm sure you all know that we're a country in Southeast Asia. Many don't. When I mention Thailand, some people give me a quizzical look and said, Taiwan. I said, no, Thailand. And so, so it, they're close, close together in pronunciation and, and both from Asia. So we're a country in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, a country of 64 million people. Uh, we have neighbors on the mainland and also that are islands close by. And I make this point because uh, while countries in Southeast Asia, you would know and recall uh, the Vietnam War area, the uh, Indo-Chinese Wars, what happened in Cambodia, what happened more recently in Myanmar. But I just wanted to mention the positive aspects of it now is that uh, there are no more major conflicts among the countries in the region. Those 10 countries that I, I was mentioning in Southeast Asia are now part of what's called the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN. There are 10 of us now, all at peace, and uh, we hope to be one community by 2015, which is very ambitious. By one community, it means more closer together politically, economically, and culturally. It will not be one community as close as the EU. There will not be a common uh, currency yet. And I, with what's happened, I don't know if that is coming. So at the moment, uh, it's an association that was established way back in 1967. But at that time, Southeast Asia was divided into the five countries of uh, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines. More what you would consider the liberal, uh, democratic, uh, Western-oriented countries as opposed to the communist uh, dominated uh, or socialist Indochina of Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and Myanmar. But at the moment, uh, we are together in this uh, association of Southeast Asian nations. These are our neighbors. We have uh, land borders with Burma, or what they call now Myanmar, Laos, very close and they could speak Laos, and us in Thailand would understand probably 80 to 90% of what they're saying. Cambodia and Malaysia. So it's a very diverse group. Of the 10, you have uh, the Philippines, which is predominantly Catholic. You have Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and to a lesser extent, Vietnam, who are predominantly Buddhist. Like in Thailand, 95% of the population would be Buddhist, probably 3 to 4% uh, Muslim, or maybe 2% Christians, Catholics, and Protestant. Next, uh, I couldn't talk about Thailand without give, putting in a pitch for the tourism authority. I can't go back to New York without uh, uh, telling them that I made a pitch for Thailand and Thai tourism. The picture you see is, is, is what traditionally you would think of, of Thailand or Bangkok. It's a picture of our grand temple and the temple of the Emerald Buddha, which is the main site in Bangkok. That particular setting you see was built about 200 years ago. So it's one of the main uh, tourist sites in Bangkok. But uh, 
This is the more modern Bangkok. And uh, finally, transportation, because Bangkok has always been well known for its infamous traffic jams. Uh, we're trying to resolve that and with the, what you see are sky trains and the underground system, things are much improved. And uh, more so that uh, last year, we had a record number of tourists in, in Thailand. It, the number was 22 million people, 22 million people visiting Thailand. So that was another record for us. We are a predominantly uh, agriculture uh, country. It, it always have been. And uh, till recently, agriculture was our number one export, particularly rice, teak, and corn. Uh, rice, we've always been uh, traditional rice growers, although other countries like China and India would produce more than us. We have been the number one rice exporters because they have a big population to feed, whereas for us, we are able to export it. Uh, for the past 10 years, we have been the number one rice exporter, partly because of the climate and partly because of the uh, policies of our neighbors. Take our neighbor to the south, Malaysia. They were growing rice, but now they've said they will not be growing rice. They are going for cash crops like uh, rubber and palm oil. So together, uh, we have been the number one rice exporting country in the world. At the moment, industry and uh, production is high on the list. We are the, called the Detroit of Asia, basically because we have no policy of a national car. There is no national car for Thailand, but uh, every, practically every con car company you can think of has some production plant in Thailand. For the US, of course, there's GM, Ford, Chrysler Company. From Japan, you have both Honda, Toyota, uh, Mazda, and the Nissan, Dash, Datsun company. From Germany, you have Audi, BMWs, and Mercedes, all producing in Thailand and exporting elsewhere. So it's, it's, it's been a gradual change. Uh, also, a lot of uh, electronics and computer parts. If you don't think of China, then for Thailand, it's been one of those uh, major uh, foreign exchange earners. We had a big flood last year, and it affected the whole supply chain of car parts for the Honda factory in uh, southern US, uh, which is Western Digital, who produces all the hard drive. It disrupted the supply chain a bit. So this is the plug for the Tourism Authority of Thailand. Uh, in 2012, uh, travel and leisure through their survey said, uh, named Bangkok as the world's best city. It was number one. For the ladies, you can look at the last line. It says, affordable shopping. But that, that I shouldn't be uh, highlighting too much because it's not political appropriate. So everyone should enjoy shopping in, in Bangkok. <laughs> The next is, uh, you know of our Thai food, but a few of you may have not heard of this particular curry. It's called Masaman curry, and CNN Travel last year also named it the top 50 most delicious food, and it was number one. Uh, it uh, comes as a surprise to you with pizza coming in number two. Uh, I think uh, that, that would come as a surprise. So that, I think, should give you a brief overview of the country. At the moment, uh, those of you who follow the news would know that uh, we have had elections. Uh, next week will be another big elections for the governor of Bangkok. And you'll be having your mayor of, of, of Omaha election soon. But for us, it's going to be a big test 
because they are the two can most likely candidates. One comes from the main opposition, who's the incumbent governor, and the other is from the present governor. So it's not only a test of who's popular in Bangkok, but it's a, a, a big contest among the, between the two major parties in Thailand. Uh, unfortunately, the political, cli political climate is still uh, very tense with the opposition and the uh, government in power still at loggerheads on practically every issue. But uh, I just wanted to assure you that on the part of, of our foreign policy and our relations with the U.S., that is not one of the contentious issues. Our relations go back more than 200 years and it has always remained strong. During the time that we, need, we felt we need help, during the 50s with the communists uh, coming down from China and all, all into Indochina, during the Vietnam War, the U.S. was a staunch ally of ours and continued to be so. And on the, that second point that I, I was asking you about, uh, I think it's the third point on who fought with the U.S. We've always fought together in all the major wars. The only asterisks would be Iraq and Afghanistan. We were there with you. We weren't with you in the outset when you went in with uh, your own operations. And at that time, I think President Bush was saying, either you were with us or against us. We were on the sidelines. But as soon as you were made it a part of the UN operations, we joined. I think many countries were of the same view, that if it's part of the UN operations, we would participate, and that's when we did. So, so we went into Iraq and Afghanistan with you, a bit after you, but uh, also with you. And that is not a sticking point. But on the second part of my talks, it's not moving. Okay, which is the UN. I think many of you are uh, interested because I'm being co-hosted by the model UN group, the International Relations Club, and Professor Morong's uh, Asian World Center. So I think that may be an, uh, an issue of interest to you. It's, it's a very controversial issue here in the US. Uh, is the UN worthwhile? Is it uh, worth keeping? Are we paying too much? Uh, they are really our friends. And I think uh, having served there twice and the current ambassador there, I would say yes, it is not perfect. Uh, there is much that could have been done and should be done. But uh, ultimately, it's the member states to decide and there are 193 member states. Uh, when you saw that designation, ambassador and permanent representative of Thailand to the UN, I am one of 193 others. There are 193, 192 just like me representing other countries. So in your case, you, if you were following the news a, a month or two ago, my counterpart was Dr. Susan Rice. She was your ambassador to the UN and still is. She was at a time a candidate for the Secretary of State, but uh, partisan politics being what it is, she has withdrawn her nomination as Secretary of State and you now have Senator John Kerry as your Secretary of State. But that is what we do. Uh, ambassador designates the rank that we are the representative of our country to another country, or in my case, to the UN. The permanent representative, I think, is, uh, let me tell you, it is not permanent. Uh, you don't stay there until you die or you abdicate like the, post, the Pope, but uh, permanent uh, side of it is something from history when it, the UN was established. 
the headquarters was established in New York, so, and you anticipated that there would be a permanent representative there in New York. And that has how it came about. Rather than having people coming over from capital every time there is a meeting, we are there full time, 365 days a year. That is where we meet, it's not where we work. Uh, that small building you see is called the General Assembly Hall, which uh, we meet every year, throughout the year, but the most hectic time is from September to December, which is the General Assembly session. And at the, the, the first three weeks is called Leaders Week. That's when all the leaders of the world, all 193, come together and, 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 and talk. There is a general debate which is open by the President of the US. President Obama is always the third speaker on the first day of the debate. So you would see that televised on CNN and whatnot. And then that tall building is called the Secretariat Building. It's where the UN staff work. We don't work there. We all maintain offices all around the area. You can buy your office, you can rent your office, but when you attend the meetings, this is where you attend the meetings. That's me presenting credentials to the Secretary General. That's what you do when you first come and take office. Once you present your credentials to him, then it means you are officially endorsed. You can begin your work. And unless and until you do, then you're what's called an ambassador designate. And we do this throughout with every country. My colleague who's ambassador to the US does the same to President Obama. He would present his credentials, which is a letter from my king saying, I've been appointed. He's, I've appointed so-so as a rep, as my representative to your country. And that's what we do. Next is the inside of that small white building that you see, which is the General Assembly Hall. The importance of this assembly is that all 193 countries are represented. Every country has one vote, everyone being equal. But there is a catch that whatever the resolution or decision passed by the General Assembly has no legal binding. You have a moral obligation to, to follow it, but it is not legally binding. So this is one of the, the big questions in the UN of equality. But the next, uh, this is just representatives uh, debating and presenting speeches in that hall. But the more important uh, organ in terms of peace, security, or what's happening in the world where you open your newspaper and read about it, what's happening now in Libya, the situation in Mali, in Somalia, the piracy, is dealt with by this smaller other body called the Security Council. And what's unique about it is it's a creation of the World War II, end of World War II era. It is comprised of 15 members. Five are permanent members. The other 10 are elected and rotated for a time of two years each. I think you can name the five. They are the victors from World War II. That's what the, the, those that don't like the Security Council would say it is a legacy of 50 years past. But that's the reality. The five also happen to hold nuclear weapons. They are the US, Russia now, the former Soviet Union, now Russia, China, France, and Great Britain or United Kingdom. They are there permanently. They are the permanent members of the Security Council. The rest, you get elected for two years. You work there for two years, then you're out. 
For Thailand, we've been a member of the UN since 1946. We've been a member of the Security Council only once in 1986, 87. We are a candidate in 2016. But just to put it in perspective, out of 193 country members of the UN, 70 have never been on the council, never once. And among those, I would venture to guess that maybe another 50 don't aspire to it or would not get elected. They are these smaller countries who either don't have a real interest or with their small number of personnel would be hard pressed to, to be on the council and working on a daily basis practically every day of the year for two years. Uh, you have formal meetings, you have informal consultations going on practically every day. Today you may be talking about uh, what's happening in Libya, tomorrow what's happening in Mali, where the UN should be sending troops, uh, what's going to happen with the Somalian pirates. All these issues are dealt with by this Security Council. And the elections is very competitive. Just to give you a sense, I think we had elections a few years back where you need to get two-thirds of the countries to vote for you. 193 countries, that means you need something like more than 120. And it was very competitive. When we were elected in 1986, we went around seven ballots until we finally reached that threshold. And there have been instances where the number of ballots have risen to 100. You just kept on voting and voting and no one won. Finally, I think a third country was asked or offered to be the compromise candidate and was finally elected. So that is the sense. Uh, this past elections two years ago, it was so competitive that the rumor has it that one country spent about 80 million US dollars campaigning, inviting people over to their country at that government's expense. So it has happened. And this is the security <coughs> council set up as it is now. You have the five countries that are at the head of the table in purple, which are the permanent members. And then the rest, they are members till 2013. And then another five replaces them. And then on the other side, they are members till 2014. And then five more countries will replace them. And you will notice that they are divided into regions because uh, that's the major regions of, of the UN. You have the uh, Latin American group, you have the Western European group, the Eastern European group, the Asian group, and the largest group is the African group. So based on that number, the allocations of, of, of members into the group, you would have more or less based on the numbers of, of, of countries from that particular region. But more and more so, the UN is involved in social issues. This picture here is not in New York, but in Geneva. It is called the Human Rights Council. It is uh, the highest body that looks into issues of human rights, human rights abuses, uh, practices of countries. It is elected by us in New York, but then the work is transferred to our colleagues in Geneva. So they look after what's called the Human Rights Council. And this is uh, another very competitive uh, organ. With the US and the Permanent Five, they have no permanent seat there. So they have to be elected also. The US was just elected uh, the last time this uh, October. So it is something that uh, even a country like the US 
needs to campaign for and gets your views known across and hopefully be elected, which is the case. We were elected two years ago and we served as president until end of 2012. We were the, we were the president of the Security Council. So what do I do in, in that, that last portion of, of, of that uh, topic, the ambassador experience? As I told you, I'm the representative of Thailand to the UN. And that means I deal with the Secretary General of the UN and all his staff and all the other officers who are in charge of various issues from uh, environmental issues, climate change, economic issues, uh, millennium development goals which we have just completed and also issues like uh, when we supply troops to the UN peacekeeping, peacekeeping operations. I would be do dealing with the UN because we send the troops over, we pay the cost, then we are reimbursed by the UN as all other UN members are reimbursed. But also I deal with my 192 other colleagues. So what I need to do is represent Thailand, get our views across that these are issues that are important to us, and hopefully persuade them to support or be part of various groups or groupings within the UN. At the moment, uh, water is an important issue for us, being an agriculture country with the big flooding we had in Bangkok last year. So, for instance, I'm a small group of uh, steering group, steering committee for water. And it's us, Thailand from Asia. You have Finland and from the uh, Nordic countries. You have uh, Hungary from the Eastern European groups. And you have Tajikistan with me. These are examples of what we do. So basically, that's number one. And then all these organs that I was telling you about which is very competitive. We are, as I said, a, a candidate for the Security Council in 2016, and in 2014 we are a candidate for the Human Rights Council. So that means a lot of lobbying efforts on my part, meeting my friends, the ambassador, me be sure, making sure that he tells his government that Thailand's a candidate, if possible, to vote for Thailand, and if it happens to be the case that his government says it's up to you, then I really have to make friends with him. That at the end of the day, when the ballot comes, he would either write Thailand or take that box. So it's a very time-consuming but pleasurable uh, job. So, so that, in a nutshell, is uh, what, I, what I do on a daily basis. Uh, at, the, at the table we were discussing, and, and, and it's also very uh, social uh, activity is very important, because with 193 countries, each one celebrating their national day on a particular day, they have a reception, they have a cultural event, they have a concert. You are expected to be there because at the end of the day, when you have your own national day event or concert, you expect them to be there. And the only way you can assure that is you attend other people's. It's just like uh, any family because if you don't, 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 don't take care of them, they're not going to take care of you. So, so it, it's, it's, it's like a, I won't say a social club, but, but outside the normal operating hours, that's how we operate. Uh, I couldn't resist. <laughs> good luck, uh, good luck this, this, this uh, Saturday. I think you're coming up against uh, your uh, division leaders and, and Creighton will be one of the fault, uh, teams I hope to be following in March. Thank you.